Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 63. This episode is Charmaine Chan, who, apart from having one of the coolest names ever, uh, is an amazing VFX artist at ILM. She's done a lot of really cool stuff, guys. She's done a lot of really cool stuff, which only makes sense because she's a really cool person. But uh, we talked about how uh, she's from Hawaii, so we, got a we dived into that a little bit, how she got started in VFX, where that interest came from, and then I found out what compositing is, so... Woo! Yeah, I know what that means now. Uh, but the amount of work that they're doing, guys, is crazy. Crazy, crazy. Like, when Hal was on, I was like, my mind was blown. And Charmaine was like, oh, there's more. And uh, that was such a cool talk. Um, she uh, worked on the episode 8 shot with the pork that jumps up on the falcon. Yeah, that was Charmaine. And she breaks down into just how intricate and detailed they get into uh, with all the movies. Then we talk about uh, World of Warcraft because it's awesome. And then we talk about her project called Women in VFX, which I highly, highly recommend. It's really cool. Uh, it's about a bunch of women at ILM who are just killing it behind the scenes. And you get to know some of their names and their stories. And it's really cool and good on Charmaine for, uh, for doing that. Uh, so check that out on YouTube. Check out Charmaine. She's awesome. So without further ado, here's the interesting podcast episode number 63 with Charmaine Chan. Theme song time. Yeah. I love your I love your decor in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. got my, my my things. I just put the Ahsoka swap, really, like five minutes ago. That's awesome. I was like, quick, quick, I need to look cool. Impress guests. <laughs> look cool. I'm like, I have nothing interesting behind me whatsoever. I mean, you know, clocks are cool, you know, depending on who you are. Yeah. You know, I knew it was a clock, <laughs> so it must, already must does its time. job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on time, whatever that means. You're in San Francisco, I'm assuming. That is correct. Nice, nice. How do you like it? I love it. I mean, I've been living here for like the last 11, 12 years at this point. Wow. I've been yeah. I've been once. It was about 12 years ago, actually. Fun time. Oh, okay. Yeah, we right. passed the baton off. I went lived like a band trip. It's a nice city. It's nice. It gets cold, it surprisingly, for California. Well, you know, global warming, that'll fix everything. Yeah, Psh, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you're not from there, though, are you? No, I am originally from Hawaii. Really? What part? Yeah. Um, I was born on Molokai, but I also lived on Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island. So kind of all across kind of bounce the different around. islands. Yeah. Hawaii is what you're saying. <laughs> I think I know Hawaii pretty damn well, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, my parents my parents still live there, so I visit them quite often. So cool. yeah, Hawaii is, Hawaii is home for me. Is it as amazing as I think it is? I've never been. I mean, I'm biased, right? So sure. <laughs> I mean, actually love facts. living in Hawaii. Yeah, no, Hawaii is great. It's like a totally different world where everyone is just like one big happy family and like everyone is so friendly, like the people completely make it. Sure, that's so cool. And that, yeah. well, but it also, helps, it also helps that it's just gorgeous, right? Like it's beautiful and, you know, fair. warm weather. You can't really go wrong. Fair. I almost went there. Uh, I just got married and I almost went to Maui for my honeymoon. And then we found out, oh, to get to Maui from Florida is really do it on a whim. You can't. It's also a really long flight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like 10 hours, yeah. right? Like... We're like, let's just do a cruise instead. Do Maui next year. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's the yeah. other side of the globe. I know my dad lived in Hawaii like 15 years or something. He just talks about how great it was. One day. Yeah. One day. So when um, did do you... definitely visit. Is it is... So correct me if I'm wrong. Anytime I get someone who's from somewhere else, I'm like, what are the stereotypes that are completely wrong? Like, I had a guy from New York, and I was like, tell me how many times a day you say I'm walking. He was like, <laughs> zero. I was like, oh, all right. So, Hawaii, yeah. okay. Do you do you call, like, California the main the main state? Sounds such a weird way to say it. But, like, is that called the mainland in Hawaii? It is called the mainland. Okay. It is totally like, oh, I'm going to the mainland for school, you know, like. Sure, okay. Everyone, it, it, 
it's definitely a separate entity. Yeah. <laughs> um, but regarding like actual stereotypes, I think the best I got was like, oh, do you surf to school every day? And I'm like, <laughs> what? Absolutely. How yeah, else are you going to totally. get there? <laughs> I've or seen like, Lilo and Stitch. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. Or like people forget that Hawaii is part of the U.S. So they're like, oh, do I have to exchange money to get there? And you're like, exactly the same. We have Target, <laughs> we have Best Buy. Like there's definitely no difference. You just go, you, yes, you specifically have to change money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all like, you can exchange money with me. That's and right. I will, like... <laughs> That's right. I accept everything before yeah. you go. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. When was the first time you came to the mainland? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, uh, my aunt lives down in L.A., so, like, oh, cool, I cool. quite often, and, you know, like, visiting her during the summers with my family, like, that was my, like, introduction to California ah, overall, and okay. so when I was, you know, in high school, applying for colleges, um, you know, most of them were pretty much all within California. And my cousin, like, my cousin went to UCLA, so that, that was, like, my introduction to the U system. Um, but, yeah, like, when I was in high school, I pretty much applied to all the UCs, and I ended up getting into UC Irvine. Um, and Sweet. that's where I studied for school. Yeah. Uh, okay, that makes sense. I've heard from a lot of people that I've talked to, actually, that's a similar thing. They have family in another place, and that was kind of their introduction as well. So there's, like, let I mean, culture shock isn't the right term, but you know what I mean? There's less of, like, a... Uh, learning curve when you're like, oh, okay, this is different because I'm, I'm. It's got to be very different from Hawaii. Um, I mean, to be fair, Hawaii and like Southern California, you still have like warm weather, you still have beaches, but it's like, fair. I mean, LA is like, you know, the giant city. You yeah. have to drive everywhere <laughs> to get anywhere, and it's just like it was like thrown right into like the rough of like, hey, kind of almost like welcome to Hollywood. This is like this so is LA, weird, right? You know? <laughs> this is where Pretty Woman was filmed. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. And the thing is, like, you know, people are so different, right? Like, coming from Hawaii, like, everyone there is super chill, laid back, and, like, no one's in a rush anywhere. And it's, like, everyone is just, like, all right, you got this appointment, <laughs> this, this, then, like, everything is scheduled, and it's just, like, go, 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 go. So it was definitely a different, like, change of pace for me. Sure. Um, but I liked it, because I'm very much a person who's, like, I like being under pressure. I like, like, having things to do all the time. Damn. So, like, growing up in Hawaii, I felt very, like, isolated it was just like sure. stuck, like again like Lilo and Stitch right like when <laughs> Stitch was like going around like, I can't escape like I had the exact same feeling growing up and you know you kind of do as a kid right like you're of you're bored of what you love and so you want to go somewhere that's the complete opposite of that always and- always I live in Florida and I've come to realize just in the last couple of years I do not appreciate the beaches that are around me I'm like I just want mountains and like forests but then everyone else is like I haven't seen the beach in my life I'm like it's right there, I guess. <laughs> no, yeah, we take we completely take advantage of like what we're used to every single day, and like every time I go back to Hawaii, I'm always just like, "Why did I not leave this?" Place? <laughs> it's so pure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I remember like the thing is, I went to high school on the Big Island, and my school was like kind of up in the hills, up on the mountain, mm-hmm. and so I would have to drive up there every single day. But like driving back, it would be facing the west, which is like where the sun sets. And, like, I remember coming down, I'd be, like, so pissed. I'm, like, the sun's in my eyes, stupid purple sky. Like, it's so bad. Um, but now, like, I drove it recently, and I was, like, oh, my God, this is, like, the most beautiful <laughs> thing ever. And I remember it, like, pissing me off. That's amazing. So, definitely, definitely different lens, different perspectives, you always. know, growing up versus, like, when you're, when you're a kid. Always, always. So I know you are a visual effects artist. When did, Correct. When did that interest start? being from Hawaii you don't normally go hand in hand like kind of chill no. to visual yeah, effects not at all. I feel like there wasn't a very direct path for me into visual effects like mm-hmm. the thing was like I was always kind of one of those nerdy geeky kids like I love the computer I like computer at age 12 like what? I was very much yeah I was, the thing was like I had my cousin who went to UCLA he ended up working in the video game industry I also had another cousin who had his own like computer fixing like Nice. Business. And so, like, during the summers, I would, like, hang out, and, like, I learned, like, the ins and outs of, like, hardware and just, like, how things work. And mm-hmm. so they were kind of, like, my introduction into, like, the tech world. And so I hate to be, like, stereotypical, but, like, my, my parents just assumed that, like, I would go into something math and science. And Fair. they saw me like, following my cousins, and they're like, oh, you'll probably do, like, 
computer science or engineering, just like them too. And then you work at EA, you work at Microsoft, you know, the very like, very Standard. stable. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so the thing was like in high school, I had the chance to take a uh, computer programming classes. Oh. Um, what was great about living on a big island was that um, the computer science teacher that I did have, he was actually an astronomer for Keck Observatory, which is up on Mauna Kea. What? And so we're learning like C++ and Java and like we were programming things for like the telescope up at the Keck Observatory, which was really amazing. Yes. Um, and so I was like, this is super fun, you know, like it was great, but at the same time, very at text and code every single day. And I'm actually a very visual person. Uh -huh. And so I like that there is a visual output to it where you're like, oh, I can see I'm moving a telescope. Sure. At the same time, I was like, I like pretty pictures. <laughs> fair, fair. And so when I got into UC Irvine, I had to declare my major. I was like, well, like the default is like computer science. But I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do <laughs> like, pro strictly just programming for the rest of my life. Fair. And, and so I, you know what? I'm going to, the thing was like, I also dabbled a little on, like, web development and web design as well, and that was kind of, like, my outlet. Like, mm -hmm. this is where I'm going back and, like, showing my complete, like, fangirlness. But, like, I used to I run a girl's website, and it was, yes. like, my, like, most favorite thing ever. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> the Spice Girls website on the side where I, like, like, basically always release new videos that they have, but also, like, compiled, like, you know, edited together music videos. And I just, love like, it. Like, my touch into, like, the real, like, media side of, um, you know, production, right? Uh -huh. and so I was like, maybe I'll be an art major and I can do a little of, like, art and technolo technology, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when I when it came to declaring my major at school, I was like, Spice you know Spice. what? I can be an art major. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, I think I'm going to be an art major. Um, and it was actually kind of interesting because, like, when I discussed this with my parents, they were just very, like, art major that's not gonna make you any money like they're just thinking Always. oh I'm paintings on the side of the street <laughs> oh, there's so much more to art like these days than just the traditional like painting sculpture drawing etc etc um which don't get me wrong are great you know fundamentals and like you know the base art like knowledge to have is great Mm -hmm. But to me, I was always, like, more curious about how the digital medium can be used for visual storytelling. For sure. Right. Um, and especially because the digital medium is such, it's so reliant on technology. That's where I was, it's such a great bridge of both. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, despite, you know, my parents being, like, unsure about it, I eventually, you know, I was an art major. I focused on, like, photography and video production. And because I was down in Southern California, I, like, met a lot of, like, you know, fellow classmates who were industry, but who also were like, you know, who introduced me to other people who are also in the industry. And I was just all like, oh, hey, I can look beyond just the web. Right. You know, there's this world of like film and TV that can also combine both of my love of art and technology. Wow. That's, I yeah. mean, you said it wasn't a clear path. Kind of seems a little, <laughs> one thing be no, the top of another. I think it's like, yeah, like one thing definitely led to another, but I don't think I had a clear set idea of what I was going to do. Sure. Um, down I love that. And the thing was, like, I've always loved, like, since, like... Same. Yeah, since, like, I was a kid, it was just, like, that's what I grew up around. That was, like, my world to escape. And, like, whether it be films or, like, video games, it was just, like, I love that idea of, like, taking your imagination and just making it real, essentially. Right. right. Yeah. I'm obsessed with movies. That's pretty much all me and my wife do. And the right. idea, like, movies is the accumulation of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people coming together to make a thing, which... Ideally, is impossible, but it's epic, and it's, yeah. it's so cool. It's so deep. So that's pretty interesting. And that, so you, got, you got into I that. mean, that's the thing regarding, like, film. Like, there's so many different people coming together to work on something. Right. But the thing is, like, when you find that, like, right team, when you get those right people who are all super passionate and super into what they're working on, like, mm -hmm. that's, that's how you get those incredible films out there, right? And, Absolutely. Absolutely. That's – man, that's crazy. So when – Hmm. So you got your own crew sort of thing. That's kind of neat. You saw it. Like you said, it's be it's the best when when it comes together kind of uh like almost like it's meant to be. You get the right people that are into the right kind of things and you got one guy that does this, one guy that does this. And like I mean obviously people are into multiple things. But when you have someone right. who's really good like I know nothing about lighting, but when a guy does and then somebody else knows about storytelling, you got a well-lit story, I you know? Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And that's the thing like I've always been 
like to be fair, I'm I'm very introverted. Like for me, my ideal case of like a day off is like staying at home or craft or something fair. like that. Like fair. But at the same time, I love interacting with others. I love being in a collaborative environment when I can just like feed off of your knowledge, your energy, and also bring part of my energy into that as well. Like that is, I think, what makes super fun. For sure. For sure. And just the, the human connection, you know, when you, when you, a collaborative process, there's something like almost spiritual about it where you just connect on the right wavelength and you're like, oh, snap, this is awesome. And then art. This is, yes. this is well, art, it's, apparently. It's interesting because like the human connection, I feel like it's always forgotten about when it comes to visual effects, right? right? Like for real. people think we're just pushing buttons and then magic appears on the screen. Please. And it's like, you don't realize how much like, yeah, how much discussion, how much being working with one another we do before you can get that result that you see on the screen. Crazy. And I feel like trying to humanize our industry more is like something we need to do. Agreed. Um, 100%. Which is, which is tough. You know, when you're dealing with technology, when you're dealing with computers, when you're dealing with like technology that's getting to the point of, you know, AI being able to do certain things. Like, it's, it's a great future, you know. But at the same time, it's like, it's really exciting to see what that potential can be. And like, how do we adapt to, you know, all this new technology and you know, that will make even better visuals than we have before. For sure. For sure. Yeah, it terrifies me. But anyway, <laughs> so when did you, so you got into that, you found your, you found your crew, if you will. When did you like specifically, or you know what, back up. What is compositing? <laughs> What is compositing? That's always a good question. It's funny because, like, anytime I tell someone I'm a compositor, they're like, wait, so you compost for a living? I'm like, no, no, not composting. <laughs> collage. Compost. You collage. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, like, the easiest way I tell someone is, like, think of it as advanced Photoshop. I layer, yeah. I put things together, except it's moving imagery versus just a still image. Um, oh, Okay. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's pretty much, you know, image manipulation, pixel manipulation. Um, we're, it's just like we're putting together everything to make it look like that final product that you see. Gotcha. Okay. The other thing that people don't realize in the visual effects industry is how many people, it, like how many layers of people are involved in a specific shot. Like when I found out that some people have, correct me if I'm wrong, assets? They called assets? Yeah. Okay. I don't really know what that is. I'm pretending like I do. There's someone who does this, and then someone who does this. Someone who does like creature animation and stuff. Like, like, yep. I, like I've had I've had Hal Hickel on, who's yeah, and Hal's great. Dude, he's amazing. And he talked yeah. about. I was like, oh, so you worked on like you know the pod races and stuff. He goes, no, I did like ass. I was like, oh, okay, so like what did you do? He goes, well, there was this shot, and he worked on Jurassic Park. And I was like, yep. okay, so tell me what you did here. And I was like, oh, so you didn't do that part, but you did this part. Somebody else does that. And I was like, the the it's like an it's like the whole iceberg theory. You know, like what people see versus what's there. What's that? It's like, yeah. yeah, it's like you've got the movie and then you've got like the VFX part. You're like, you have no idea. It's craziness. Yeah, no, the thing is like, you know, we have so many amazing, like the great thing about working at ILM is that like I'm working with people who've been there for 30, 40 years, basically invented, you know, what visual effects is. John Noel did. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he also invented Photoshop. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Like Literally that. invented. No big deal. Hashtag MVD, right? Yeah. Oh. That's right. But no, the thing is, like, these like these people are so skilled, and they're skilled in very specific things. Mm -hmm. And so you learn, like, how each one of them, you know, got into their specific discipline, you know, whether it be animation, mm -hmm. match, you know, paint, you know, like. And the thing is, like, being a compositor, I'm the one who's at the end of the process. I see everything put together. Oh. Um, and, and it's, like, it's interesting because I have to kind of learn how each one of that, you know, those who are in those specific disciplines, what they do and how it comes to me at the end. And right. like kind of understanding the whole pipeline overall, which is great. Because for me, I'm like, I'm a person who's like, I want to know everything before I can specify one thing. Sure. Um, you know, you, you need to be, be kind of well-rounded. You need to like acknowledge all this because, you know, those are the things that makes your final image. Um, and so it's great being from Hogger that way because it's like, sure, I'm getting this, you know, this rendered robot from my lighter. But at the same time, it's like that robot is doing like crazy spins and whatever. And like, it's like animator did that. But then the creature dev artist also like, you know, helped tweak little things here and there. And then like the paint artist completely removed this car that was, you know, in front of it. Like, you know, just like 
every step of the process, you're just all like, this is amazing seeing it like progress. Wow, that is nuts. So when you decided to go into visual effects and stuff, was ILM always a goal or was that something that you kind of like led up to by doing different things and then, oh. Um, no, I mean, the thing is like, I was very, like, I was very typical once like I'm about to graduate. I was like, I'm going to mass apply everywhere. Right now. <laughs> like, whether it be LA, New York, like San Francisco, do what you do. Just, like, just like mass apply to be like, I want in. And the thing was like, I didn't have specifically visual experience. Like I worked at Deluxe before ILM and I was doing, um, DVD Blu-ray menus design and like, really? animation. Something, like motion graphics essentially. Oh. Um, and it's funny thinking back because I'm just all like, it's so not a thing anymore because no one has physical. Like, How weird is that? Uh, but it's crazy because I think I'm like, oh yeah, it was so cool because like you want to do like cool animations and transitions, kind of make them into a game when you're going through the menu, put little hidden like, e you know, Easter eggs so that yeah. people can like, they click right, you know, three times and they get like, you know, a special menu with like a special feature. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, like that. That's not, you know, something that the newer, younger generation of kids will, like, acknowledge at all. Mm -mm. But, um, yeah, so I was doing more, like, motion graphics than anything. And I was just like, you know what, as long as I'm saying that's, like, visual and, like, you know, tech at the same time, it didn't really matter what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I applied everywhere, like, from, you know, Pixar and ILM to, like, um, at one point, I think I applied for a company that was doing, like, you know, all the, like, grab up for, like, sport events. So, like, oh, if yeah. it's, like, a <laughs> game, you know, like, when they circle it and, like, do that and there's, like, cool animation. Oh, yeah, little play thing. He went here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, like, I, I I actually got an offer from them before I got an offer from ILM. I was mm -hmm. about to go there. And, like, <laughs> ILM called a week after, and I was all like, just kidding, I'm going over there. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was kind of like I, I just wanted my foot in the door, no matter what door that was. For sure. Because, um, again, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and the thing is, like, when I applied for ILM, like, because I didn't have previous um, visual effects experience, I couldn't exactly apply to be an artist straight off of the bat. Sure. So I actually was, I applied to be a digital resource assistant, which is a little bit more technical position. Hmm. It was, it's kind of like what we consider technical assistants, resource assistants. They're, they're more people who deal with, like, data management, resource management, um, deal with, like, the renders and servers and stuff like that. So it was a lot more support-oriented. Gotcha. But, but it was, like, know. yeah, the thing was, like, it was such a great foot in the door to ILM. And I learned so much from being in support positions before I moved into artist positions, um, which was, like, I think it makes me a better, well-rounded, like, employee who actually knows a lot more about the ins and outs of just like sure. visual effects, just the one side of like aesthetics or just the one side of the technical. Right. No, that makes total sense. So how did you make the jump then to go from the technical side to be like, actually what I can do? Yeah. So it's funny because like when I applied for the position, I mean, I had a small reel based off of like the DVD venues and stuff yeah. that I had. It's all you I need created. really. But like, they're like, oh, this is cute, but it's not really needed for this <laughs> position. Um, but it was like, in my first position, it was like you worked a lot with the supervisors just to like, you know, make sure that each show is getting their appropriate need of like the space management and like resources needed to make the show that mm -hmm. Um So I built really good relationships with a lot of the supervisors. And yeah. eventually I moved yeah. into like an assistant technical director role where I'm essentially supporting all the artists and like their software. So that's gotcha. when I saw the ins and outs of like, oh, you know, the camera match movers, they use our own um, proprietary software, which does amazing tracking, um, while like, you know, animators dominantly work in Maya. And so I learned a lot about like how Maya works and like Bell and like Python scripting. And it just gave me a great general overview of like each single one of those disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I kind of knew that I wanted to do something more, like, 2D-oriented just because I came motion graphics background. Sure. Um, and so I kind of found my niche just, like, working a lot with the Roto paint and compositing and supervisors. Um, uh. And I was, like, helping support them and, like, their needs on their shows. And, you know, I just built these really great relationships with people who could, like, you know, teach me exactly what they're doing and I can help them make their process of what they're doing a lot more efficient and faster. Uh, um, makes sense. Makes sense. So, yeah. 
And so at one point, I think it was like on, I want to say like Pacific Rim time. Ooh, um, nice. Doing, um, you know, this was kind of when the hype of 3D, you know, film was, 3D oh, yeah. stereo film was kind of happening. And so, you know, we had this giant film. I mean, Pacific Rim had so many, you know, almost 2,000 easy shots. And so we had to create, like, a stereo process of dealing with it because we, you know, some things were actually shot, you know, in stereo. And so I worked, like, directly with um, both the lead stereo supervisor and my compositing supervisor on, like, creating this, like, efficient pipeline of making our 3D process more streamlined. And at the same time, they gave me a chance to, like, work on shots, like, to composite, like, do 3D oh. shots. Um, so it was like, not only am I helping like support them and their pipeline, but they're giving me a chance to like actually work on shop. Um, so that was kind of like my leeway into actually getting into the artist role. So it was like work my tech side to get more artist work. That's awesome. So what, do you, yeah. do you remember the first shot you worked on? Um, the first shot, I, so I actually had the chance to composite a few shots before and my first ever shot was actually for Mission Possible 4. Um, what? And John Knoll was my supervisor. Todd Vizzeri was my oh, comp supervisor. What? And Powerhouses. Yeah, I remember it's like, it was a shot, I forgot the name of the actor, but he's just like falling off of the roof, shooting his gun backwards. And like, we had to replace, you know, the inflatable that he landed on and like the deep background and like adding some gun flares. It was like a pretty simple shot, but like that was my first ever shot. I remember oh, like what? the first time I showed it in dailies and of course you know john Noel being a supervisor i was like nervous as hell but he was like super like knew this was like my first shot and he was like when i saw he's like this is a great first pass but you know let's clean up the edges here let's do x y and z and i was like oh, you know i'm like yes yes i will do everything <laughs> exactly like you said and like i remember the first time when like i finally had a remix version of that shot and i and i put it into dailies and john was like final and i was like <gasps> My first final shot Dude. Like, for Mission Impossible. <laughs> this is kind of amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. And the yeah. job is all right. Dude. Yeah. Dude, if you're going to do it, do it right. Wow. Exactly. I couldn't have learned from, like, any better of, like, you know, people to learn from. Like, these are the veterans of the industry, essentially. Absolutely. And that's the thing I love about ILM. It's like, I am literally working with so many different people who are just, like, so talented, so skilled. And I think that's what keeps me here is that like, I feel I'm constantly learning. Like if I'm not learning and growing, then I'm not going to stay at a place. But because Mm. ILM has provided such a like place that like basically pushes you to learn as much as you can. Like it's, it's addictive. Like I can't stop. Sure. That's amazing. That actually makes sense because that was like, the whole thing about George Lewis, you know, he was very pushing the envelope. Like, there's a documentary about episode one, and they're talking about the visual effects that, like, hadn't been created yet. And he's like, I'll go figure it out. And then you see John Knoll just in the background, like, I guess we'll figure it out. I'm I don't know. <laughs> I feel like more and more often, it's, you know, we, we get pushed with that, right? It's kind of like, oh, no, we have to do 1,200 shots that are, like, all underwater. Like, how are we going <laughs> to you know? And, like, everyone just, like, gets into me, and we're all, like, again, same thing, just, like, yeah. what are we going to do? But <laughs> the, thing is, like, it out. <laughs> the thing is, like, we're all problem solvers. That's what makes it fun. You know, mm. we're just all, like, all right, we got to break this down. How are we going to handle this? We've done something similar before, so we have somewhat of an idea. Like, how do we take this to another level? Sure. That's amazing. See, I, I, I'm obsessed with creatures. That's, like, a big thing of mine. Like, the creature department, the puppeteers are, like, big heroes of mine. And that's half of the equation. Because you guys, like you said, for Mission Impossible, you had to cut out the inflatable. You had all those things. Like yeah. people don't really much work in just not even like visual effects. Typically, visual effects heavy movies, like with giant fighting robots and stuff, and Pacific yeah. Rim, you know, uh, Transformers, wink. And uh, yeah. you wouldn't think that like a movie like Mission Impossible would have so much VF shot, but it's like you guys are everywhere making it real that we see. It's like on set, it's a little different. There's a big inflatable yeah. back there. It's amazing. Exactly. Well, I think it's, you know, it's an interesting thing talking to people who are not in history about visual effects, and they're like, oh, why do you even really need a visual effects? And I'm all like, what have you seen recently? <laughs> and they'll say something like, a romantic comedy or something. And I'll be all like, yeah, that one had visual effects too. Like, right. everything you've seen pretty much has visual effects these days, whether you realize it or not. And, you know, when I 
to people visual effects online. You know, there's usually two different visual effects. There's like, there's a very obvious in your face, giant robots, you know, Star sure. Wars out in space, like the very explicit, like there's visual effects in here. Sure. And then there's the visual effects, you know, like that's when, like I'm the most impressed by visual effects is when it's like, you know, no one can tell about it. There is visual effects. Sure. And that's the fun of it all, right? Like we get to be magicians for like, you know, two hours and just completely blow your mind when we were when we tell you oh yeah that was like not real whatsoever that's right man that's crazy so i know that you also worked on a little movie called harry potter yeah what small, small independent small. i mean you might have heard of it there's like wizards on it don't really, you know. yeah how crazy was that talk to me talk to me it's pretty crazy i mean the thing is like it always blows my mind like what projects we get to work on mm-hmm. and you know i I've always been a huge fan of just, like, blockbuster films overall. Same. But I don't think I really understood, like, the culture and the significance that, like, certain franchises can have for people. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I started working on ILM, like, because, to be fair, like, the, you know, when people ask, oh, what's the movie that got you into video effects? And, like, for me personally, it was, like, Jurassic Park. I remember seeing it as a kid, and I was like, oh, my God, those dinosaurs are so real. Like, that's what it felt like to me. Same. But it was, like, a one-off movie that I was like, it's fun, it's great, you know, that's it. Um, and, like, you know, I've, I've seen Star Wars, I've seen, you know, like, all these major fights, but, like, it never quite had that, like, I never had that connection to it quite sure. yet, because I don't think I was aware of, like, the impact fan, like, films can have on fans. Right. Um, and when I was ILM, you know, I met more people, they, like, told me more about just, like, the impact that, like, certain characters or certain storylines had for them. And, like, for me personally as, like, like I identify as a queer woman as co- of color. And, mm-hmm. like, to me, representation really matters. Visibility Absolutely. really matters. Absolutely. And so films and stories were always my escape of, like, you know, being able to relate to something. Right. And I never realized how strong that could be until I started working in the industry and seeing the impact, like, these films on people. So when I work on something like Harry Potter, it was like, I knew about Harry Potter. I watched the films. I never read the books. So I was just like, eh, you know, it'll be fun cool. to work on. I like magic. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the thing is, like, you know, it was for Half-Blood Prince. Mm-hmm. And so we did the sequence where it's like Dumbledore was like, he had that, you know, huge fire effects sequence. And like, in theory, we're all going after him. And it was just like a really, it was a really powerful scene. And I was just like, wow, this is like, it's great how so visual can like move and affect someone you know oh yeah and so it was great to you know i love i loved working on it it was like one of my first like major projects to be assigned on and it was it was a great experience like i learned so much from it and it was just getting yeah, it from like the start of like the concept art all the way to the end of like that final sequence like it's just it, i'm always blown away every single day just yeah yeah even though I'm working on it, I'm just, <laughs> no, this show looks amazing, you know? Right? Like, That's the yeah. other thing about ILM. Everyone I've talked to, you're all so into the thing you're working on, you know? And, like, yeah. when you think about the entertainment industry, and a lot of times, it's like, eh, you know, it's a job, it's a thing it is, whatever. It's like, explosions right. are happening, they're like, eh, it's four, it uh, happens at four. You know, but you guys are like, look at how crazy this fire dragon is, and you're the right. ones making it. That's so cool. Well, the- the thing is, like, you know, don't get me wrong. I've definitely worked on a few films that are not exactly the most, of you know, course. like, award-winning films. Of course. Um, but, like, you know, story aside, you know, at the end of the day, we're still here trying to make the best visuals to present the story in the best way possible. Absolutely. And I think, you know, me being surrounded by people who always want the best, who always put in that 110%, it's, like, again, it's addictive, and it's something that just, like, you you have to put yourself around people who are like that to get the best result possible. Absolutely. When you work with the best, you become the best. You become the best. Working on it, yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> you know, absolutely. I mean, I've seen your shot. I can't do, I don't even know what's going on, so good job, <laughs> you know. Like, that Thank looks you. that looks yeah. cool, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and then from there, you worked on, I know you worked on the Avengers. Um, I briefly worked on Avengers. I worked on um, the last Captain America Civil War. That's what it was. Um, I knew it was yeah. a superhero. Civil War was great, um, by the way. Yeah, and, and the thing is, like, it, it's interesting, right? So, like, Lucasfilm, when I first started, was its own private company. Mm-hmm. We got bought up by Disney, what, five or so. But we've, mm-hmm. we've had this working relationship with Marvel for 
you know, since the first original Iron Man. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching the, pro- like, I wasn't assigned on the first Iron Man, but I remember watching the progress of it. And John Favreau was just, like, super, like, actually anti-visual effects originally. He was just all, like, Weird. I, you know, there's no way you guys can make this look real. So, like, there was a <laughs> lot of just, like, actual practical Iron Man suits, which are really cool, don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, for sure. you know, <laughs> if you have a physical Iron Man suit, you're just like, I, I, I want to wear that. How can you <laughs> touch it? I hear yeah. you. <laughs> But, like, seeing us take, like, those practical suits and make them into a CG suit that was just, like, it, you know, the first Iron Man is still one of my favorite Marvel films Incredible. overall. And, it, and it's, we've worked on so many Marvel films since then that, like, you know, I've, I've worked on Iron Man 2, and I also worked on Captain America Civil War. And it's, it's just fun seeing, once again, the progress of how Marvel has taken this universe oh, and, yeah. like, their expectation effects. And how they're pushing the boundaries of movies and effects, right? Like, Dude, Infinity War was bumpers. It's hard. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, like, you know, I'm also a comic book nerd fan. And, like, nice. you know, when you're looking at things on, you know, when you're looking at your comics, you have, you have your visual representation. But it's, you know, it's still, like, it's a still image. You don't see the animation of it all. Right. And, like, you see, like, one frame of, like, a certain universe in the background, you know? And... The thing is, like, a lot of it is, like, yeah, it's, it's great seeing it in just, like, a single frame. But, like, how do you make this into, like, a complete, like, the environment that someone can walk around and actually interact with? Right. And that's what I love about the Marvel, just, like, universe overall is that, like, what I thought was impossible and only viewable on a, like, still image in a is, like, not, you know, it's completely possible these days. Absolutely. That's the other crazy thing, like how quickly technology has evolved in such a short amount of time. You know, anything like the first Jurassic Park came out in like, what, 93, I think it was, like early 90s. So just in like 20 some years, we're able to do Thanos crushing a moon and stuff from like, oh, this is a raptor. Cool. You know? Yeah. Amazing. It makes me kind of scared for what's going to be the next 10 years. You're like, I can't, I don't know what's real. <laughs> well, no, I think, I think the question is like, what, what is, you know, whoever creates media out there, like, or like stories out there, what, what is their next level of that? Like right? they can go even beyond, you know, what their mind thinks they can do. Agreed. I had a guy on recently, actually, I think it'll be the episode that goes before this. Uh, it's a guy named Robin Guyver. Amazing. He's one of the creature puppeteers, worked on a lot of the things over at Pinewood. And he right. talked about the first movie that he worked on was uh, Gravity with Sandra Bullock. Wow. And he said yep. that like 98% of that movie was like, And what they yep. would do is have the actors on the wires and then the puppeteers would move the actor in a way that made them look weightless so that they could focus on their performance. Because if you're hanging from wires, your face will show when you're trying to move. So they yep. tears. So I was like, you're telling me the first thing you puppeteered was Sandra Bullock? He's like, well, I mean, kind of. Yeah. So it's crazy. Like, that is incredible. The, like yeah. I said, the amount of visual effects that's everywhere that you just wouldn't realize is it's it's really right. cool. It's all those little details, right? Like those little details right. completely makes things pass or not. It is, and it's also one of those things that, from an outsider, seems to be. I have a friend who's an audio engineer, and he says it's one of those jobs that you only hear feedback if something's wrong. Yeah. You know, exactly. it's like it's like a th- job, and I think that's. That needs to be remedied, and that's why I'm here. And uh, no, dude, that's so great. Cool. The thing is, like, yeah, I think it's amazing that you're giving all these people who are usually behind the scenes you a chance to. to talk about, you know, what they work on. And once again, humanizing us because the thing is, like, it's Thank so you. easy to just see an image, just see the pure effects, and just be like, oh yeah, that's but it comes cool. with everything. It comes yeah. with filming. Yeah, yeah. Please, as somebody who I used to make a bunch of videos growing up, and I remember the thing, it was like a wizard versus warrior type thing, as you do. And I had to right. do this, like, lightning thing from, like, the wizard staff to whatever. Yeah. And yeah. it was one of those, like, uh, Adobe After Effects presets. Yeah. I spent, yeah. like, nine hours trying oh, to keyframe a thing. And I was like, it was it was literally a second. Just, and I'm yeah. never doing it again. So I'm glad <laughs> for people like you that are good at it and that enjoy it. Because I don't. I really don't. So. Yeah. No, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, everyone finds their niche, and, like, once they, like, find it, and they're just like, no, this is great. I remember doing it and taking nine days or, like, you know. Exactly. But at the same time, it's like, how can we make that even more efficient? How can we make that look even more cool? You know, like, there's just, like, there's this never-ending expectation of perfection. Artists, you're always aiming for that perfection. Always. Which doesn't exist, as with everything. (laughs) 
you know, but like you still go for it because the thing is like you you want to see that be as cool as possible. Absolutely. So as a compositor, you said you're at the end, right? So yeah. what does the shot look like to you? I'm assuming there's no music. Or is there music when you're doing like crazy I mean, stuff? No, and, and the thing is like, you know, we usually work in parallel with the people who are doing sound effects, who are doing, you know, the oh, music. Cool. And so sometimes we may get like a cut of like the sequence we're working on and there's, you know, the dialogue. So we can at least, you know, hear what's going on and have a general sense of what's going on. Sure. Um, I mean, occasionally we'll get like a rundown from our supervisor of oh, this is what's happening in the sequence. So, you know, based off of that, you know, this is the feel that we want to have for the sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, generally we, we sometimes have audio, we sometimes don't have audio and it's just a matter of like, being on the same page as your supervisor and your art director of making sure that like what you're putting together has that same feel throughout. Fair, fair. Does it make, do you, when you watch movies, is it extra weird now because you've been behind the curtain and you're like, all right, yeah, I remember what this was like with just words and has music. Oh, it's not bad. Right. Not bad. Yeah, no, the thing is like every, I can't help but be critical. Of, of course, of course. Film. But there are some times where I'm like, I just want to enjoy the film, you know, and like, <laughs> I like, I have to check myself out. And sure. so the when we're working on, you know, films, we get, you know, sometimes we get like just a small sequence and you don't really know what the actual storyline of the film is mm-hmm. versus like, you know, we're working on Star Wars, we're working on everything. So oh, yeah. you kind of know what's going on. Um, but, you know, there's this temptation of like going through all the sequences and just watching it so that you can like see the whole film. Sure. But, you know, you lose, you lose that sense of fun sure. of like the surprises and what's going on in the film. So I generally try to avoid doing that. And I just, like, focus on, you know, again, is the look, what is the feel, what is, like, what mm-hmm. is the motion that we're trying to capture through this visual image? Um, I focus more on that as opposed to, like, just the overall story. Probably best. As, yeah. as somebody who enjoys movies, you don't want to ruin it for yourself to be like, mm, I mean, I guess it's okay, that shot is, that's good. It's, yeah. I mean, sure, I've, I've worked on a few, like, oh, crap, I think this is, like, the, like, spoiler major moment yeah. of, like, <laughs> the turning point of the film, and I'm like, well, I, now I know it. There's yeah, exactly. nothing I can do. Yeah. We're Infinity War, and they're disappearing. You're like, what is happening? Should I be watching this? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know, like, we, at ILM, we're working on at least, like, what, four to eight different projects at a time. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, work, you walk around the office, and you see other people screen, and you're like, I think I just spoiled myself. Like, <laughs> you know, like, you have special you, you ILM blinders. <laughs> exactly. It, it's hard, but at the same time, it's like you can, you know, I can choose to forget things, you know, right. and actually enjoy a film for what it was. Yeah. The unsacrifice of the VFX. It's true. It's, yeah. <laughs> we salute you, Charmaine. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you know, there's been a few times I've also been on set and shot, like, photography reference footage and stuff like that. And it's what? like, it's interesting, like, see that because people are like, oh, don't you lose the magic when you, like, can see like oh he's just hanging from a wire there over like a two <laughs> like as opposed to being you know dangled above the sky you know and I'm just all like no I feel like being able to see the beginning to the end makes sure. it even more you know like that makes sense. the thing is like so it's so hard to not really I'm not sure if spoil is the word but like it's so hard to like make it so that I am not like feeling impressed like like that this magical world does exist because to me there's still a lot of the process where I'm just all like I don't know how he did that but he does <laughs> sure no that makes total sense because there's also like a bit of like accomplishment as well when you're, and you're like no it, it looks real you know why because it did not look real a bit ago and that is it, it like adds another layer of almost appreciation so I get it I understand that and I remember in the beginning you said that uh, you mentioned World of Warcraft which is yeah. pretty awesome and uh Full disclosure, I there was a summer that I played uh-huh. so much. Wow, there was a server that had it was like a thirty percent XP rate. So you went, right. you leveled up much quicker, and I like, yeah, oh, oh, <laughs> I capped a human warrior and an orc warrior in the span of like a month, like level eighty to both of them. Uh, nice, nice. I mean, I don't want to brag. I'm not trying to impress you, although I kind of am. Uh-huh. But now it's your like- turn. <laughs> 
it's my turn to talk about my wild wild character. <laughs> this was to lay the runway of comfortability. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, like, I've been playing WoW since it first came out, right? Which was, like, 2003, I think. 2003 yeah. or 2004, something around that time. Mm -hmm. And it was just something me and my, like, friends and call together. And we built this really cool, tight-knit community. And, like, we had a guild. We ran dungeons. We yeah. ran raids. The fact that we ran, like, 40-man raids. Like, how? Oh. <laughs> I was like, well, how are we organizing 40 people together <laughs> to run a raid? But we somehow did, you know? Like, it was, you know, it was such a great, like, experience of the online community world, right? Like, where sure. you all have one goal and you're getting together and putting your best characters for you, like get that you know bring down that one boss you know at the end oh yeah and the thing is like you know world of warcraft is not exactly the most like stunning visuals like the graphics <laughs> at its time was like you know it's fine yeah it was, i can tell what know. was going on <laughs> yeah exactly uh, but at the same time you know you got immersed in this world and these stories and these lores that like were so incredible and thought out um yeah, I, I still to this day, I'm, I'm still playing WoW, right? Yeah. Like, I just came back after, like, a two-year hiatus because I'm like, there's an expansion pack yeah, right. coming up. <laughs> that trailer yeah. was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And part of me is just all like, do I really have time for this at, at this age these days versus, like, back in college? You make time. But, That's like, what we do. <laughs> no, absolutely. You do make time. And, you know, we I worked on Warcraft, the movie, as well, which was, Perfect like... Perfect segue, such, huh? Wink. It was, exactly. <laughs> and the thing was, like, you know... There were certain people at work that I did play WoW well with occasionally on and off here and there, mm -hmm. but it was never anything like hardcore like I did when I was in college. Sure. Um, but it was kind of known around the office that I was like a Warcraft nerd. Yeah. And so like when I heard that we were going to be working on Warcraft, like I went straight to my manager. I'm like, you have to put me on. This <laughs> you don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> yeah. And and so I was lucky and the scheduling worked out. And so my manager put me on Warcraft. And I remember we were working on, I think it was a trailer for for Comic Con, and Ooh. it was this one like it was this one shot where they were like showing the high elves, and I, for me, I've always rode for the horde. I'm totally a uh, horde. Like, this interview's I over. <laughs> but like you know, there's there's you know there's little things that you like are aware about from the game. like when we were making Warcraft with Duncan Jones, he was like he wanted to make sure that we were true to the lore, we were true. So every little aspect were like a fan. If they freeze framed on like the movie, they'd be like, "Hey, is this like how it is in the game?" Like you know, people who really dissect. Oh yeah. Um, like we wanted to make sure every part of that was like that. And so I was working on this shot with like two high elves, and I was like, "Their eye color is wrong." Yeah. And then my, like, wait, what? And I'm all like, "Their color green, but the green eye color are for <laughs> blood elves, not high elves. They should be purple." And I was all like, you know, when I was working on Warcraft, I was still kind of like, you know, I was probably five, six years into the company, but, you know, in comparison to everyone else, you know, that's still very, I was a noob. In right. comparison to right. I was like, do I have the right to say these things? But I was like, <laughs> I, was like I know the fans are going to point this out if we don't correct you have so I was to. like, I have to say something. And like, my supervisor like quickly went on the internet and was all like, eye color of Warcraft. And he was like, Oh crap, Charmaine's right. We're gonna have to change the eye color of these elves. And yes. I was like, yes, Moment of pride. Right <laughs> yeah. But the thing was like, you know, it it would have made a difference. Like, you know, the people at Comic Con would totally have pointed that out. Um, so, you know, it's things like that where you you're able to nerd out to like your full most potential yeah. and still be like like, Oh yeah, it's good that you knew that. It was good that, you know, you're your job may not have that, you know, requirement, but, like, the fact that you have that knowledge you know, helps make that experience of bringing franchises that, you know, were another medium and bringing it into the film medium more, you know, impactful for the fans. Absolutely. So they have you to thank for the right eye color. Well done. Well <laughs> done. <laughs> I'm all like, that's, that's my fame in the that's Warcraft right. <laughs> universe. <laughs> you, like, try to find that note that he wrote and just frame it. Be like, look. I, I do that, actually. You know, I would. Yeah. I'm I would. Absolutely. That's that's crazy though. I didn't know that. I liked Warcraft. I thought it was an awesome movie. I'm not gonna lie. You know, I guess you might be biased because I'm such a fan of the you know, of Warcraft overall, but I actually really enjoyed it. And right. I felt like a lot of Island's work was really underappreciated. Like Agreed. art were amazing. Like absolutely their expression and animation to like the little hairs on them, like 
a right. lot of what I'm doing when I was compositing these orcs was just like, can we see the little hairs and how they interact on their body? Like oh, just amazing. little details like that and how like the spec hits, you know, or backlights, you know, those little hairs. I thought it, it looked amazing. And, you know, like, storyline might have been not the strongest point. Actually, might have not been the strongest point. But, you know, like, I feel like every single Warcraft, like, friend and fan that I, you know, talked to afterwards about the film, they were just like, no, you know, like, visually and just, like, the worlds that were created mm-hmm. were exactly what they wanted to see Agreed. versus, like, you know, the end game. Yeah, of course. It, yeah. I dug it. I really did. I really enjoyed it. And uh, speaking of that, Doug, that you've worked on, you uh, you got to work on a little space movie, you know, little indie, yeah, little indie, another small, very film. tiny, yeah. very few people have heard of it, I'm sure. Um, right. Let, let's talk. Let's talk. You worked on. Yeah, I worked on the Last Jedi, which was my is. ever Star Wars project. To work wow. On. Um, and the thing is, like, you know. I work with people who work on pretty much every Star Wars, which is kind of crazy. And, you know, you get to a point where you're like, maybe one day I'll work on Star Wars. Um, it's in the next room. You got your ear with the glass. Yeah. And so the thing was, like, I was, I worked with my, so the visual effects supervisor here in San Francisco for last year, I was um, Eddie Pascarello. And I've worked with him numerous times before on other different projects. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we just jive really well together. And... I originally was actually supposed to go on to the fifth Transformers because as of this point in my career, I've touched every single Transformers film. Yeah. yeah I just made, made my career. <laughs> <I've worked laughs> on <Transformers>. Yes. <laughs> but like, yeah, I was, I was slated to go on to Transformers 5, but Eddie was just like, no, I want you to come on my Jedi with me. It'd be really great. Ooh. I think that'd be a really good experience. And so I talked to my manager. I'm all like, hey, I know I'm supposed to go on Transformers. Five, but you know what? I love working with Eddie, and I think it'd be great to finally have the experience to work on a Star Wars. Um, Fair. And so, through you know a little juggling of schedules, once again, um, I was able to get onto the Last Jedi. And um, like I mentioned before, I just work really well with Eddie, and we're generally like on the same page on a lot of things. And so, you know, he gave me like the first shots that he gave me were the shots of um, Kylo versus. Crate out on crate yeah what? and it was the thing was like this was our major big sequence and it was like something that we couldn't lock down quite away mm-hmm. like there were so many different like concept art looks of like what that shot should be it was like are we designing is this like a uh, sunrise or is this sunset are we it's like you know with crate it's like there's it's, it's a salt flat right so yep. it's like to look more snowy or should we expose more of the red crystal behind it and there were just like so many memes back and forth of just like what that look would be like if i can show you the amount of iterations we went through of like what really? that environment was like, it was just it was crazy we went through so many iterations and it was just something where it was like ryan wasn't too sure what he wanted we weren't too sure what he wanted and it was like we had to find that happy medium ground mm-hmm. and took us a while but once we did it was like it it kind of clicked it just it fit and you know it's it's part of that process that like not many people talk about of just like after iteration after iteration like yeah. you think you get the concept art you create it and it's done it's it's rarely that case it's it's a lot of just like back and forth trying to find what that you know super big like impactful look will be sure. and like even though it was a short sequence, like I think we worked on it for a good like four to six months, wow. which is crazy. Wow, fair. It's like for me, I was just like constantly staring at Kylo's face, and I was like, oh, <laughs> "I'm so tired of this right now." And I was just all like, "And like, you know, we got audio at this point, so I'm hearing him just be like, oh, I want to save my soul.' Like, yeah. you know, evil. And I was all like, "Got it, got it, Kylo." Yeah, understood. Um, yeah, not gonna save so, your soul. <laughs> so it's funny because, like, you know, for me, I'm just all like. You know, you get tired of things at, at, at a point where you're just all like, come on, we just need to find all this. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's like, no, this is a very, like, pivotal moment, you know, of the film. Yes. And so, you know, you know that you need to push to get that exactly to what it needs to be. For sure. And and it's fun, you know, sitting, sitting in CineSync, you know, having Ryan there to be like, there was this, I think there was this one shot I was doing of Kyle where he's like, holding it. It's oh, like yeah. this zoom in. It, and it's like very like last samurai esque looking. Oh yeah. And 
when I finally got to the point where it was like, no, the shot I think is, is done. This is what it should be. Like Ryan was just sitting there and he was like, the shot is so beautiful. And you're just like, <laughs> like a huge sigh of relief where you're, you're just, just like. One tear. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay, this is, this is what it was, you know, meant for. Like we went through so many iterations, but like, you know, this, this is a beautiful shot and it, you know. It's so dramatic. It's so lovely. The colors, like everything, his like the reflection of the shaver in his eyes, like every little detail, like it just fits so perfectly together. Oh yeah, no, I, I'm really glad you brought up that sequence actually because there's so much that you guys did as far as you mentioned, like the hair on the orc's arm, right? Yeah. The tiny little tails. The idea yeah. of like Luke's feet not pushing the salt. You know, the, yeah. the salt hitting the lightsaber blade of Kylo, but not Luke. It's like these yeah. little tiny things that were like hints that if you were paying attention, you're like. Oh, that's what's going on. But obviously, no one's paying attention. I'm thinking about right, that, right. and just like all these, the the depth of work that goes into one shot, crazy, yeah. craziness. Well, it's it's kind of cool. So, like you know, generally as a composer, you get multiple shots to work on at a time. Mm-hmm. And so, in this case, like they specifically knew that like sequence. You know, you have shots of Kylo on one side and shots of Luke on the other side. Mm-hmm. And so they split it up in a way where like I only work on the Kylo side of things. Really. And another- this only works on the Luke side of things. And I felt like that was a really smart to do because like, you know, for me, I'm just all like, I was telling you, I was staring at Kylo, like, <laughs> and I'm, like getting irritated by him, his whitey, like, you know, little, little <laughs> things. And I was all like, but I felt like that helped bring out that feeling in sure. even more, right? Like as much as I was annoyed with Kylo, I'm like, oh great, the audience would be just as annoyed. Right. And that's like, that's the feeling that they kind of wanted to portray, you know? Sure. And because I wasn't worrying about, like, the Luke side of things and, like, what Luke is feeling, it was just, like, so just enveloped in this Kylo world. Which sure. Is kind of you could kind of yeah. hone in. You're like, he's frustrated, I'm frustrated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I'm just all like, you know, when you're doing the saber, it's like, I was frustrated, like, doing every little spark, you know, coming off of that strip. And, like, you felt it, right? Like, the spark was just, like, very erratic, very just, like, oh, yeah. short and just, like, bursting. And, you know, it's like, it was like, yeah, because that's kind of how I felt. And I was like dealing with that as well, you know. So it it it's fun to see how some of your self gets put into those shots, even though like a very clear like we're we're here for the director vision. Our supervisor is telling us what to do. Like we're you know we're kind of like expected to do certain things, but it's like no, there's still a little bit part of like each individual artist that like still put into those shots. Absolutely. Like I said, you're an artist, you know, and it is art that you're creating is coming from you. Right. Like, there's no way a bit of you can't be in it, you know, because yeah. especially spending that amount of time on it, you know, it's just it's just a natural thing that happens. Which is, a, exactly. like you said, beautiful. Great shot. Great shot. The, yeah. of the movie, I really, really did. And uh, yeah. there was a, there was something else that you worked on, which was definitely a highlight of the movie involving uh, a little pork. Yeah. Pork and uh, talk to me. Talk to me. Your your shot of the pork. Well, yes. Yes. So here's the thing. You know, we again we kind of have a general overview of like what shots we're working on overall, what sequences we're working on, and you know when we first go on a show, like most of the time renders are not done. It's just like basic previs or like we have a of the shot. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like looking through the sequences and shots, and I'm like, hey, there's like a lot more creatures going on in this episode then I felt like you know there wasn't Force Awakens or there wasn't Rogue One you know like this current Star Wars I was just all like hey we're getting porgs we're getting crystal foxes we're getting the foddy airs like yeah there's all these creatures and for me like I love animals so much like you have no idea and so like the moment I saw there's all these creatures I like went up to my corner and I'm all like that gives me every single cute animal <laughs> like at least one shot of every cute animal like yeah creature in the Star Wars universe. And I love my coordinator because she totally listened to me. Like, huge shout out to Francesca. She was amazing. amazing. And she gave me one shot of each creature. Oh, and, great. And so I was actually working more on the crystal foxes. Or, you know. Nice. Like, that was my focus first. And, like, there was this pork shot in the back that, like, we didn't really have time to focus on whatsoever. But, like, we had to get to it eventually. And, like, we didn't spend much time on it or, like, bid much work on it just because it's like, oh, here's a puppet pour. We're just going to place our CG pour. Sure. It's like, sure. Back of my mind. So I'm, like, working on this Crystal Fox shot, and eventually they're like, I need to see a, a new update of this pork shot. And so I'm like, okay, slap together. You know, like, we got paint to remove the puppet pour, and I slapped in the CG render, 
And I was all like, here's our first take. <laughs> and like, Brian was all like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not quite. We had to go back and forth a lot with just like the animation of the Korg, of like what the Korg was doing. Mm-hmm. And so, again, it, it went back to Anim and I put it back on a back burner. And then eventually, you know, we got to the point where it's like, no, we need to finish this shot. So they're like, all right, here's a week or two to just like focus on the shot and like let's just get it done. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, I'm just all like, oh, it's a cute little porg. It's fun. And like, you know, I'm, I'm going through the shot and like I'm getting new iterations from Adam and I'm also getting like new iterations lighter. And, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a very simple shot if you think about it, you know. So it's, you say. You know, so, so I say. <laughs> you know you're you're you know you're focusing on the porg and it like kind of rack focuses out and then you see chewy there too it's like a fun establishing shot of like here are two cool characters mm-hmm. um but like you know there's you know there's little subtle things once again where it was just like hey if you look at you know our basis was always looking at chewbop mm-hmm. like he was shot and played how the lighting affects him we should do the exact same thing to our cg render sure so you know, he comes in and out of light, so we made sure the porg was coming in and out of light. Um, but also, you know, like, the porg, like, jumps up to the front, so it's going to get a little bit late, and, like, and it was a question of, like, we went through so many iterations of the porg's tongue. Like, that's oh, probably yeah, what that's a little... I'm on. Like, it was just, like, how do we get it lit so it doesn't, like, weird wet tongue or it doesn't look plasticky. <laughs> you know, it was, like... I'm, like, on this shot for, like, a week of just, like, staring at his tongue and, like, adjusting the render lighting to, like, make it to a, it's not too shiny, but not too wet, you know, just, like, little things like that. And we're just going back and forth in dailies of just, like, plum will make a difference, you know. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, I eventually final the shot, and I didn't expect it to be in the trailer or anything. I was just, like, it's one of a million other shots that I've worked on that is going to be added. And so when I saw that they included it in the trailer... I was like, oh, yay, that's my shot. And then I was like, oh, wait, this is the first time people are seeing porgs. Yeah. And it was my shot introducing them to the porgs. And I was like, oh, shit, this is actually a much bigger deal than I imagined. Huge. Like, yeah, the you know, everyone on the internet was just like, oh, my God, porgs, I love porgs. And porgs just became that, like, huge character, even though it's not, like, I mean, it kind of is, but not really. Like, it's not a major character within the film. It became such a, uh, like, ingrained creature within the star wars universe now that it's oh, it kind of cr- <laughs> yeah that my shot was the introduction of the porn to the world yes i love it i was one of those people i was like i don't know what that is but i need it i like it yeah. a lot. I, mean, I didn't either when i first thought i was like is that a bunny or a penguin or <laughs> what <laughs> you know like it was just all in one but i was like it's cute so i'm gonna take it yeah whatever it is i'm into it that was me yeah. i love it i love it but, Such no, a great it was, shot. it was it was fun it's fun you know talking to people who are all like, oh my God, when my daughter first saw it, she was so excited. And, you know, like the fact that it's like hitting these younger generations of kids, like getting them into the universe, you know, it's, it's, it's great. You know, just being able to see people smile. You yeah. Know, like, like you are bringing just like two seconds of joy into someone's life, but they're so happy and you can't help but be happy because of that. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm, I, I might be a little bit biased as well, especially now, but it's definitely the best pork. I mean, let's be honest. A pork jumping on the dash of the falcon and giving his little chewy roar. Yeah. Yes, please. All of that. Yeah. You know, so good. So good. I mean, you, you couldn't help but love the dynamic of chewy and the pork. Especially because right? he almost ate one, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm into the baby. I'm all like, what's that the point when chewy became a vegetarian? Like, I, know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you never know. I, we'll, we'll have to wait in the next one and see when this one exactly. makes chewy mad. What happens? You know, we just kind of play it by ear. Two yeah. dogs meet each other. You're like, are they going to fight? They're going to be friends. We got to wait. I don't know. <laughs> but that's amazing. That is amazing. You did very, very well as, you know, with yeah. everything. But I also want to talk about this little thing that you're doing because I've seen your series. And amazing. You right. have a project of your own called Women in Visual Effects. Correct. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So... You know, the thing for me is, again, I, I mentioned before, I strongly identify as a queer woman of color. Mm-hmm. Throughout my years in college, I was very active in my LGBT community, um, and I've always been about, you know, advocacy and education and, you know, reaching out and being able to be visible 
I know future generations of kids don't have to, you know, deal with and go through, you know, mm-hmm. what we deal with in society today. And so when I started working in visual effects, you know, it was great. I'm working with all these pioneers. But at the same time, I was just all like, what are the women you know, <laughs> there. in my industry? And it wasn't until, like, you know, I kind of established myself within the company and got to know more supervisors, got to know more people, that I was like, actually, there's a lot of amazing women oh, in yes. the industry at all. But the thing is, like, you know, they're not the ones who are, you know, headlighting the, like, major big projects. Mm-hmm. You know, they're there, but they just haven't exactly gotten to the point as, you know, the male counterpart exactly the same things as well sure and i was like what what is going on you know and the thing is you know it, it's not limited to just the visual effects industry right like there are plenty of other industries that have gender inequality um and but it's like visual effects is what i've been working in this is you know i've i've made a career out of this i've been working in the industry sure. for the last 11 years and i haven't seen much difference and that bothered me and so you know, come 2016 time, basically, yeah, oh um, <laughs> when we have Hillary and Trump going on, and I was just all like, you know, I, I kind of want to jump on this momentum of like, you know, women's rights and women pushing forward and make that difference. For sure. Um, and so part of me is like, so I was an art major at school when I focused on photography and video production, like I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my photography actually was more documentative photography. Oh, okay. And I kind of had a more like a generally based background when it came to um, both photography and video. Mm-hmm. And so I've always wanted to continue doing that. And I never knew what I wanted to focus on. And I was all like, you know what? Why don't we try to start like a video series of just like interviewing women in our industry and what their experience has been like. Mm -hmm. And so I approached most of like all the female supervisors that we have at ILM. And I was like, I just want to do a really chill video series of just like, I want to hear you out. How did you start? Like, how did you get into this industry? And um, this all started again before, you know, the election. Yeah, of course. And I'm interviewing them. And it was kind of crazy because like, you know, I would bring up a question of like, hey, you know, how do you hear political, you know, yeah. uh, things that are going on? And, like, most of them were like, oh, I'm so glad Hillary is running. We're going to have our first woman president ever. Oh, no. Like, people were, like, so sure that that was going to happen. They weren't and, alone. <laughs> but, and, of course, you know, we have who we have as our president now. Which is Hillary. Um, but it was interesting because I was doing these interviews right before the election, but I also had interviews scheduled after elections. And it was the whole seeing that like shift of like all these really hopeful women of like the future, we're we're changing, we're progressing. Mm-hmm. And the election happened. And I had one interview set actually I had two interviews set the day after the election. And I had one woman who canceled on me just because like I Fair. I can't like, it was <laughs> It was such an emotional day for so many different people. Absolutely. And like she just said. But um, I interviewed Lenita Quattro, who's the only female visual effects supervisor we have at ILM, the day after. And I, was, I wasn't I was sure how she was going to, um, you know, deal with the interview. Mm-hmm. Um, I also didn't exactly know what her political stance was in general. Sure. And so we had an interview, had the questions, I'm just like, How'd you start? Where'd you go to school? Where'd you focus? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we we have a basic question of just asking, like, oh, what advice do you have for future generations of women, you know, who want to get into this industry? And she really just, like, she stopped. And she's all like, can we stop filming? And I was like, oh, oh, no. And so, like, you know, <laughs> we stopped recording. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And she just, like, she broke down. And she was just all like, Man. it's hard me as a mother of two daughters to advise them to ever go into this industry. Fair. And I was, I was like, Oh shit, we're, we're getting like down to the real Nick grit here. Yeah. And she was like, and she was just like, it was so hard. Like she just went through like how difficult it was for her mm-hmm. to the point that she is at now. And even now she's still struggling to like be able to get the exact same project as like, you know, our fellow, you know, male. Um, mm-hmm. And, and it's like, like in this day and age, why is that so difficult? And right. it's crazy 
the last the last project I worked on with Lindy was actually for a theme park ride for Wanda Wuhan. Wow. So we had these like these Chinese clients who were creating this giant theme park over in China. Everyone in China has money to make Obviously. theme park. Um, <laughs> so it was interesting because like, you know, she'd have to fly out to Beijing to like go and meet with the clients and talk about like, you know, what's going on, how's our progress, et cetera, et cetera. And she was telling me about how when she met the clients, they were like, all right, where's the supervisor? And she's like, I'm, oh, no. I'm right here. It's always me. And they're like, no, you're, you're just the secretary. Can we can we get the man who's in charge? Oh, no. And it's like, oh, and it's like we still have to deal with those kind of things. And, it's, you know, don't get me wrong. China does probably have a whole different culture going on. Of course, of course. And things exactly at the same state as we are here in the state. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like, it's like fuck. We yeah, still, still have sucks. to. <laughs> I'm not sorry, I'm sorry if, I'm, if I'm like something. No, I'm right. just like, we still with these issues in this day and age. And so, you know, we finished the interview. I interviewed a few more women. And then, you know, it was, this was like the end of 2016. Mm-hmm. And so throughout Christmas break, I was like, I have like three, four other girls who've been helping me with this project, you know, who deal with like with editing, sound, color correction, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're working on this over the Christmas break. We're making a little trailer so that we can release and start the series. And, you know, of course, the results of the election and then the Women's March going on, we were just like, you know what, we're going to release it on the same day as the Women's March because there couldn't be any better time than that. There you go. And we released the trailer and I don't know how because that's that's how the internet works but someone found it and once it's on reddit right oh, yeah. like it gained a lot of attraction and yeah it was crazy I think right I think the trailer has had up to 10,000 views which is great nice. I mean it's not big numbers but it's still like a good amount of people who actually know that this is an issue that's happening in our industry Absolutely. and that we should be talking about it and so it was like you know, it started a conversation that needed to be started. Mm-hmm. And so beginning of 2017, we started releasing videos like every other week of all the different did. Um, and I was like, I was getting emails from like all around the world from women who are like in the industry, but who are like also students, you know, who want to get an industry who are just all like, thank you for like, you know, creating it because a lot of people were just like not aware that there were women in the industry at all. You're right. And that there were women who are of such, you know, great talent and who have made it, you know, to such high positions. Mm-hmm. And kind of like being able to show people that it is possible. Like if there's at least one person within a series that you can relate to and help you make that decision, whether or not you want to be part of the industry or learn more about the industry, then, like, that's where I feel like I've succeeded with it. And that was the main thing. Like, for me, I'm, like, growing up, I wanted to see other people just like me doing things that I want to do. And that was, like, my basis of wanting to start this series. Sure. I love it. It's true. You have to leave it a lot of times, you know, and it is so, and like, that's what you said before. Representation absolutely matters because if one person sees themselves there, that in their brain opens the door. You know, and Absolutely. so much is in your head. We're like, I can't do it because, well, obviously, look, nobody like me has been doing it. So why believe that the door would be open to me? Thus, representation. And exactly. I love it. I love it. The series was great. Yeah. The thing is, like, it's the thing is, like, I. So again, like with the visual effects industry, we're dealing with a lot of always working in front of a computer, behind the scenes, like individually on their own. Oh yeah. And again, trying to humanize even our industry to people within our industry, sure. like. <laughs> Ordeal. And what I love about this series is that I've met so many incredible people. Like, I went out to London, just like, like all the visual effects houses in London are like all within Soho. And I can literally walk from like one visual effects house to another across the street. Oh, that's so cool. It, it's crazy because, like, I would interview one lady from like NPC and she's like, Have you talked to blah, blah, blah over at DNIC? And I'm like, No. And so they'll introduce me. And it's like, it created this like network of women, which I thought never existed, but actually does exist. Yeah, And I think, you know, publicizing it, making it known that it does exist is a huge, you know, step forward, like making our industry more humanized. Because the thing is, like, we are people who are struggling and dealing with a lot of the same issues, right? Like the way the industry has been going, the way that, like, we deal with um, work-life balance. How do we do a family in this industry? And, like, being able to talk to all these different women 
from all these different countries. Um, yeah, because so I went to London. I've been to Vancouver. We interviewed people in Singapore as well. And the thing is, like, it's crazy that we've interviewed all these people. They just keep coming up. Sure. So it's like, clearly, it is not something that's, like, segregated to, like, one specific location. This is something that everyone is having issues with that is that we need to, like, figure out and solve and make things better that way. And so, you know, it's it's great having, hearing and meeting all these people and getting that feedback. And, like, for me personally, I'm like, I want to see the change. Like, we've been talking oh, yeah, about, of course. like, what is the action that we're doing to make it easier better and, like, more diverse, you know, environment overall because diversity is what creates like you know the most amazing universes and stories out there because if everyone has the same story to tell then that's boring Agreed. we want to hear all different stories um so i feel like our industry strives on diversity but we don't Absolutely. have that diversity yet so we need to change that for sure. and so i mean personally for me i've been working very closely with you know a lot of people at ilm about making that change and you know clean is such an advocate for women's rights. So is and you know, like we're we're great about having, you know, female protagonists, female leads in our Star Wars series, but like we need to push that even more. Like where's our female director for Star Wars? Right. You know, where's our female right. for Star Wars? Like where are the people of color? We're you know, just like every spectrum you can think of, like we need to bring them in mm -hmm. because that is what will help elevate the franchise. That's what will help elevate technology and they, like right. we yeah, I, do. I love it. And I love that. I mean, every change starts with a conversation, you know, and I, I love that you've opened you've opened the conversation. It's so important. And uh, you rose to it. I dig it. I dig cool. it. A lot. It's a great series. People definitely need to check it out. It is on YouTube. That's where yeah. I saw it. Yes. Yeah. Or women in VFX dot com. Yeah, there we go. SEO. Get it. Yes. So uh, I'm going to I can't not ask you the question you asked. What is some advice you would give to someone? Uh, comes into the industry to do what you're doing i mean honestly like if you love film if you love whatever you want to get into that you should focus on that and do it like there's mm -hmm. no excuse you're gonna fail there are gonna be hiccups like if that's something that you are super passionate about you just got to keep striving for it and visual effects is a tough industry it's super tough the hours are long it's yeah. it's just rough and it's not great for balance mm -hmm. but if you can make that work-life balance if you can still have that drive and love for it every single day you come in then keep going at it because every day i feel like is very rewarding for me which is so hard to say out of a career yeah the average person not the same i, I like that you said that there's something i've said hundreds probably too many times on the show is that i believe that passion specifically right it's super important and i think if people have an inner drive or like an inner dream, right? And if you hold it and meet it halfway with work ethic, it's almost like it's meant to come true. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, I mean, passion is so important. I will listen to somebody talk about something they're passionate about, even if I have zero interest in the subject. You know, exactly. it's like, I don't know what you're saying, but I like hearing you talk about it. You know, passion is infectious and uh, it's cool. Infectious. And, it, and if you can surround yourself with people like that, you are doing well in life. Agreed, agreed. And you make some pretty good movies, too. Yes. But can you believe we've been talking for, like, for, it's been, it's been well we over been an hour. For a while. Yeah. Yes. This was really cool, though. I, like I said, I, I hope you've had a good time. I've had a great time. I definitely had a good time. Like I said, I've never done this before, so it's kind of cool to just, like, be able to, like, free flow in this Yeah, the right? So, That's what it's about. Again, you know? at the end of the day, it's about our, our connection and human interactions with one another, right? Like, 100%. those relationships that we build and at the end of the day, that's how we relate to one another Agreed. by being human together, you know? Right. That's what I'm saying. That's why I made a yeah. show about it. Uh, yeah. So that's, I think it's a great way to, to, to cap this here off. But I have to ask, where can people find you online? Um, people can find me on Twitter and Instagram under Charmaine SM Chan. Um, you can also go to my website, which is Charmaine Chan. Net. Um, yeah. I think I'm pretty well across most social medias. I like days. it. I like it a lot. Yeah. And your name is perfect. You just First off, yeah. Charmaine is a great name. I don't know if I said that in the Thank beginning. You. That is a great like the in as somebody named Ben who knows a lot of Brian's. Charmaine's a pretty well, cool name. <laughs> it is a cool name. I, I can thank my parents for a very unique name. Yeah, well done. My wife's name is Monique and every now, every now and then I get really jealous. I was like, I don't know any other Moniques. 
And now I know what she means, so well done. (laughs) Enjoy it. But this was super fun. I'm glad you had a good time. Anytime. Absolutely. Anytime you want to come back on, doors open. Well, thank you again. Absolutely. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you enjoyed it, stop by iTunes, give it a five-star rating. It really does help push the show to the front of the algorithm so that more people can find it. Uh, If you'd like to follow me, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff as Jedi Brian. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. So until next time, be well.